very nice. Uh, with this title, I thought maybe I should bring my walker and uh, <laughs> hobble up on the stage. But uh, Steve and uh, Christy, thank you so much. Jerry. Uh, it's fun to talk about this, actually. is a, a very great honor to get uh, assigned this. And uh, I'm going to, if you'll let me indulge myself a little bit, um, I'm going to throw in a little bit of history uh, on reflux disease, uh, kind of the prerogative of old gray-haired people. Um, actually, the seminal publication, as you all know, by Rudolf Nissen was done in 1957, which happens to be the year I was born. So uh, maybe I was destined to be a reflux surgeon uh, from, from day one. You kind of know about this. It was a, a treatment that was serendipitously found uh, for a new disease, uh, reflux disease, esophagitis, didn't exist before the turn of the uh, 20th century. Uh, not reported in any literature, any autopsy series, or anything like that. So uh, a very seminal event. Uh, I think one of the great contributions was uh, the understanding of the physiology of this. This is my mentor, Tom Demeester, uh, there, who really contributed greatly, I think, uh, to, to establishing this as a surgically treatable disease and, and increasing our understanding on, on why it happens and why it works. And, um, uh, I think we really owe him a, a debt of gratitude, as long as the other, as well as the other pioneers uh, in the field. So, uh, not much happening in the early parts of the 20th century. Uh, of course, the great names associated with anti-reflux surgery in the 60s happening, and an exponential rise in the treatment of a disease that was rapidly increasing in the population and had no other therapies. So this is the heyday of anti-reflux surgery and all the great names that we're very familiar with. And of course, this all came to a crashing halt in the 70s and 80s with the arrival of pharmaceutical treatments of reflux disease, which, thank God, are very effective. And uh, for many of us, had occasional reflux are a nice, nice thing. And uh, this led to a kind of a, a relative collapse in anti-reflux surgery uh, down to around uh, the mid-80s, uh, which is when I entered practice uh, as a young surgeon. And actually, kind of, I was the anti-reflux surgeon in Portland, Oregon in 1988 when I started practice. Uh, and I by far did more than anybody else, and I did four uh, in 1988, uh, 1989. I did about four cases. So uh, kind of an interesting thing. Of course, the big thing that happened in 1991 is... Uh, is that Bernard Delmagna published the first, uh, reported on the first result. Uh, Alfred Cruciari uh, kind of published it. Uh, John Hunter, my good friend, and I started uh, working under Alfred's kind of encouragement on animal models of treating this uh, uh, laparoscopically. And we did our first case in Portland, Oregon in 1991, <clears throat> a thousandth case uh, a little bit before the uh, millennium. And, um, and unfortunately, I haven't done 5,000 cases quite yet, uh, but I'm, I'm getting there. Uh, of course, this doesn't count cases I've done around the world. So uh, there we are. Uh, you know, this hasn't been a resounding success story. I think you're all familiar with this kind of curve. Uh, open fundal plication has essentially gone away. Uh, laparoscopic fundal plication was doing fantastic in the early days. Uh, and then uh, several things happened. Uh, Stu Speckler published a study that kind of uh, condemned it as uh, killing patients. Um, OTC PPIs uh, kind of came on the market, and the volumes of laparoscopic anti-reflux surgery dramatically decreased. Uh, I think gastroenterologists kind of, kind of fatigued uh, by hearing about the problems with it. Uh, and this has had a little recent upswing with the bad reports on PPIs uh, that have been progressively one after the other coming out, and we're starting to see kind of a little bit of a renaissance, uh, but not up to the levels it was in the early uh, 2000s. So what do I know with this experience, uh, knowing this history, having done around 5,000 fundal applications? Uh, well, the spectrum of disease has evolved and changed over time. Uh, so over the last uh, 28 years that I've been doing laparoscopic fundal applications, we do in more and more giant Parasophageal hernias is extremely rare to see these patients in the early days. And now it's kind of uh, almost the majority of our practice. Uh, motility disorders of various types uh, are increasingly common as well. Uh, redo cases, this is normal. Um, so as things time goes on, we've kind of accumulated uh, reoperative cases, and this uh, contributes to an increasing number of the cases we do as well. Uh, so I'm going to kind of give you kind of a global view of things. Uh, uh, fundal applications are a funny thing. They're very personal. They're very idiosyncratic. 
uh, and I'll kind of discuss that a little bit. Uh, so this is really my own views and kind of what I've learned over 30 years or so of doing, doing these kind of things. Results are very good. If you mind your P's and Q's, you do a good job, you talk to your patients, uh, results are uniformly good to excellent. Uh, 93%, this is kind of an early publication I did with Blair Job, uh, excellent to good results. Uh, early failures are relatively infrequent. Uh, Long-term failures are a little different story and I'll discuss that a little bit. Operative times are reasonable. Intraoperative morbidities are, are reasonable. Uh, conversions to open are exceedingly rare, et cetera. So very good results. A little bit later, subsequent uh, uh, publication or presentation that we did at college uh, a while ago, um, very low conversion rate. Uh, uh, I think I've converted six cases over the last 30 years. Um, so very unusual perioperative complications, relatively rare, and bad outcomes are fairly infrequent as well. So in summary, just kind of a global picture, there's no doubt that a well-done fundoplication performed in the right patient, especially those with severe, horrible, disabling reflux disease, do fantastic. And they're very happy with the surgery, they're very happy with the surgeon, and everybody's very happy. And Vic, uh, kind of one of our outcomes heroes, uh, published this nice thing. Patient satisfaction scores, uh, uh, which you have to pay attention to, routinely are greater than 90% happy. That leaves 10% of patients that aren't terribly happy, and, and we'll talk a little bit about those as well. So I'm gonna make some general observations from this experience uh, that I've had. And the first one I'll make is that a thoughtful, and you gotta really concentrate on these words, I selected them very carefully, and tailored surgical approach can offer the best treatment of reflux disease. The contra, contra image of that though is that a poorly done Nifsen can be worse than the disease itself. Uh, so this is a fine razor, razor edge, what's thoughtful and tailored and what's poorly done. Kind of a, a sub-observation of that is that the wrong fundoplication done on the wrong patient is an absolute recipe for disaster. Disastrous for the patient, disastrous for the health system, the insurance industry, and disastrous is particularly for the patient. Uh, so Samit did a great job of presenting this, and I really stress this point. He emphasized it, I think all of us would emphasize it. An extensive preoperative evaluation is critical for especially the difficult patients, and it's very, very important for all patients. Uh, throughout my whole career, it's been a question like, do I have to do a pH study? Do I have to do manometry? Can I get away with this? And getting away, considering that recipe for potential disaster is not acceptable. Uh, you have to maintain the highest level uh, to achieve good outcomes and maintain this kind of good surgical treatment. Uh, complete medical evaluation, a uniform, consistent symptom assessment. And I think every practice should establish what that should be. It's not anything that's objectively confirmable, but you should always ask the same patient, all the patients, the same question every time you see them and in the same way and grade it and maintain that and follow it. Endoscopy motility patient, 24-hour pH testing, liberal use of gastric emptying tests or other tests, as Samit kind of emphasized, are very important. Uh, this is kind of an early uh, study that once again Blair Job uh, uh, did, uh, presented at SAGES uh, many years ago, uh, showing based on our preoperative testing uh, how often we changed our surgical plans. 33% of the time in this small cohort of patients, around 100 patients, based on their preoperative testing, we thought we knew what surgery we were gonna do, changed our minds to some extent 33% of the time. So work them up very well, very thoroughly. Uh, I think it's an important point, uh, and this is kind of varied throughout the history of laparoscopic fundal application, that there's no single procedure that's perfect for all refluxing patients. Um, you know, if you don't have a high volume of things, it's acceptable to learn and master one procedure, get really good at it, and do all the details. Uh, but if you do that, you really should say no to a lot of patients. Other than that, if you have a high volume reflux uh, practice, my opinion is that you really need to know how to do a lot of different procedures and be flexible in applying those and, and tailor it to the procedures. Uh, we know that objective evidence says you don't have to tailor fundal applications, but in fact, I think it's a good idea. 
in our practice in Portland and in France, uh, uh, we, I started doing Rossetti Nissens. We had no technology to safely divide the short gastric vessels. Uh, and now we have a whole list of procedures that we apply on a routine basis depending on the patient, uh, their needs, their wants, their desires, their physiology tests. And uh, I think it's very important that if you're going to have a broad-based reflux practice that you uh, know these different procedures and who they apply, apply to. Observation two, fund applications, unlike many other surgeries, are a surgical art form. I'm a bit of an artist and a free thinker, so this kind of appeals to me. It's a little bit frustrating to see people that want a real recipe for tell me how to do it and I'll do it, uh, because this is, is no dotted lines, no pinpoints. I often tell the fellows and the residents, every suture you place has to be within three millimeters of the exact right place or the thing won't work. And of course, we don't know what the exact right, they don't know what the exact right place is. I do, but they don't. Uh, so proper construction is actually a absolutely critical. That, in can you decrease the sound? Uh, atraumatic dissection, uh, adequate mobilization, secure hi hiatal closure, proper choices of what portion of the fundus to use, uh, proper position of the wrap. <laughs> That's not me talking. Um, tailoring the wrap around the esophagus. You'll notice that many of those are totally subjective findings. They're not objective. We can't give people uh, uh, a landmark uh, to do. Uh, they're subjective findings. How tight is tight? What is tension? Uh, what is the right part of the fundus? Uh, these are things that only gain by experience, mentorship, and other things like that. Uh, so this is, uh, I was asked to kind of give a technical thing, so this is my in one slide technical details. I, I think this is not so important. The way I do it is not necessarily uh, the be all and end all. Uh, everybody does these slightly different, but they do it thoughtfully, and they do it consistently, and they do it precisely. Um, you know, use the minimal access, be kind to the crura. I often tell fellows and residents, treat the crura like they were your own testicles um, and do not abuse them. Uh, so a no-touch hiatal dissection, extensive mediastinal mobilization to kind of compensate for insufflation, compensate for our lack of being able to adequately uh, or accurately uh, assess tension, permanent sutures, intracorporeal suturing, um, is important, uh, and by and large, I'd advise to avoid suturing gadgets, including robots. Uh, two centimeter wrap, and I'm not being mean to robots on that, but a lot of this is by haptic feedback, and by losing haptic feedback, you lose a lot of the ability to adjust, to assess tension. Uh, shoe shine maneuver, uh, my friend Jeff Peters kind of came up with the term, uh, because you want to create a loose, but not a redundant wrap. It's not fixed in place like with an open fundal application by adhesions. And so if you leave redundant wrap uh, posterior, anterior, it'll for sure herniate in the mediastinum. Uh, I do a short gastric to short gastric approximation. You can do an anterior wall to posterior wall like uh, Tom Demeester taught me to do uh, as well, but it's more difficult to teach and to do reproducibly uh, using a large bougie. Uh, liberal use of things to minimize tension, whether that's a collis procedure or uh, relaxing incisions in the diaphragm, and uh, endoscopic control to make sure that you have a good wrap that's around the esophagus, not around the upper stomach, and is symmetric and not lopsided. Uh, so this is a little bit difficult to teach, a little bit difficult to learn. Uh, that's kind of led to this being a little bit um, um, volume related, a little bit like uh, pancreatic surgery. Uh, some data kind of supports that. The complication rates and outcomes are somewhat uh, volume related. Uh, of course, you can teach it and you can learn it uh, as well. Uh, kind of a large, uh, uh, a large uh, population-based assessment of that as well, kind of showing that uh, results are not as good if you do a few of them and can, uh, in the general population, if you cut corners, lead to poor results. Why this is important is it's kind of contaminated the field for gastroenterologists. So by and large, they say it has to be the only good guy. I don't know who the good guy is, so I'm not going to refer case, any cases for, for fundoplication. 
Observation three, uh, you have to talk to the patients. Patients have to get realistic expectations about what you're gonna do for that. So this is not, a, this is in a way a cure for GERD, but it doesn't come without a price and the patients have to know about it. Um, you have to inform the patient about the post-operative side effects of this procedure. Almost all these patients will have at least transient side effects and if you don't tell them about it ahead of time, it drives them crazy, they're unhappy. Uh, if they had horrible acid reflux and you get rid of it, they forgive you sometimes. Uh, but if you tell them ahead of time, uh, it's cool and they'll be, be good with it. Uh, you have to warn them that this is a repair with native tissue that degenerates with time like all of our tissues do, like our meniscus does and like everything else. So uh, this is from our 20-year uh, long-term results uh, uh, that we published, and you'll see a fairly continuous slope, downward slope of continuous failure, and pretty much 1% per year of a laparoscopic fundoplication will fail. Natural senescence. And you need to warn patients about that. Uh, even if you do a great job in 10, 15 years, it's not that unusual that they'll need to have a redo surgery of some sort or an endoscopic tightening. Observation four, you need to follow your results. Uh, this is true with any surgeries we do. I think it's particularly true with fundoplications for the reason I'll tell you, but if you don't follow your results, you're really gonna have trouble. And this is kind of what we do um, uh, currently. Uh, once again, we do symptom assessment forums. Uh, as Vic kind of pointed out, quality of life is one of the great parameters for patients on measuring what they do. So it's good to know what impact you're having on the quality of life. Uh, manometry, 24-hour pH testing, which we do on a fairly routine basis. So we offer this to all patients. Their insurance won't pay for it. We'll cover it from our own motility lab. Selected patients, some other tests as well. Why do we do this? You can't believe the symptoms. It's well known. Everybody knows this. All of us have published papers on this, uh, that symptoms are a very poor indicator of actual reflux it's almost a coin toss, it's a 50-50 thing. So if a patient that you did a fundoplication comes back in and says, my heart burns back again, there's a 50-50 chance that it really has. Um, there's also a chance, 35% chance, that they come in and say, ah, oh, thank God, I have no more heartburn, I'm not taking anything, that they'll actually have some residual reflux and need to be on medication or something else. And I think it's important for your own education. So you don't evolve as an anti-reflux surgeon unless you follow your results and really know what you're doing. This is just kind of a partial list. I, I'm still learning. 5,000 cases, I still learn. Fellows say, oh, let's do it this way. I say, okay, what the hell? Steve Demeester comes, comes and joins us, says let's use this kind of mesh uh, and see what it does. Okay, let's, let's do it. Let's follow the results and, and see it. So these are a list of things that I've changed over time based on kind of studies and randomized studies that we've done and changed and evidence-based. So this is how you evolve in this particular field and kind of learn uh, again. And I think a very critical thing is if you do something wrong in this or if you don't do everything right and the patient turns out bad, you don't send those patients back to the gastroenterologist. Never send those patients back to the gastroenterologist. They're yours for the rest of your life. They should be yours for the rest of life. Uh, if you break it, then don't do it. That's why the gastroenterologists think that 80% of Nissen's turn out as disasters because the patients that do well go off into, on their life and you send all the bad ones back to them and they get a biased view. So if you want to continue doing fundoplications, uh, take care of those patients afterwards, uh, own them. Uh, so, Madam Chairman, Mr. Chairman, um, in summary, comprehensive preoperative evaluation, critical, tailor the approach to the individual patient. Forget those kind of literature things that say you don't need to do a tailored approach. This is a little bit different meaning. Uh, either do one procedure very well and say no to lots of patients, or learn lots of different procedures and learn which patients they belong to. Careful, reproducible attention to technical detail atraumatic resection, adequate mobilization, secure hiatal hernia uh, closure, all those things that you see all the time. Follow your results and change your practice based on it and if you break it, own it. And uh, one final thing, have to 
really give thanks to kind of, I work with the world's best anti-reflux surgeons, and I'm very fortunate in two continents, and uh, so I really thank them and thank for the honor for presenting. Thank you.